<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a, another live podcast webinar of the Recruitment Roller Coaster. Thank you for joining us today on a very, very sunny afternoon. So, if you're outside in the garden, if you have a garden, um, hopefully you can be soaking up some vitamin D while you're uh, enjoying this. So, I'm delighted to be joined by um, and Tony Bates, who's going to be co-hosting this with me today. Um, honoured, honoured, Tish. Yeah, honored. no, thank you, Tony. Um, we'll do a very quick intro in a sec, and obviously delighted to be joined by Neil Carberry, CEO of Rec. Um, and and thanks for your time, Neil. We really appreciate it. Hi, Sharon, Tony. Really pleased to be here. It's important that we all talk to each other in these changing times. Most definitely. So, very quickly before we do a very sort of quick intro, just housekeeping for everyone, and I just want to let you all know how you can best engage with. Uh, Neil and and also me and Tony. So you'll have a couple of options at the top in the chat there where Marion and Liz have already messaged saying hi all. You're welcome to chat in there and speak. The next the next uh, panel is is Q and A, and what you'll be able to do in there is submit your questions. So a big part of today is going to be all about getting your questions answered. And as we're talking, as we're chatting, um, you can use that Q and A function to submit your questions. And what you'll be able to do is click upvote on the questions that you'd love for us to ask. Um, and we'll make sure we get those asked as well. So what I'm also going to do for all of you, just to help in terms of the context of what Neil can go into a bit more detail on or a bit less, is I'm going to submit a couple of polls in a second, which is just going to help us understand who who's joining us today um, to ensure that we give you as much value as possible. So. Tony, let's just start with you very quickly, just just for everyone's benefit. Do a short intro, um, and then Neil, if you follow up with um, yourself, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so uh, I'm Tony Bates. I'm managing director of a firm called IDEX Consulting. We have uh, 45 staff. We cover financial services, general insurance, and legal, uh, with offices four offices across the country: Birmingham, London, Manchester, and Glasgow. Um, so Perfect. Hisham's kindly invited me on. Uh, after appearing on his podcast, so I'm keen to fire some questions your way, Neil, and appreciate you coming on to to have a go at answering them if you can. Yeah, and and Neil, let's enlighten us all. CEO of Rec, what what do you guys do, um, and what has been going on in in Neil's world over the last couple of days? Um, yeah, that's a good question. CEO of R of the REC. Look, um, the REC is the uh, recruiters' organisation. Basically, I talk a lot about. Um, your REC when I'm talking to groups of recruiters because we're entirely owned by the members that's 3,300 agencies okay. and about, and about 10,000 individuals Wow. Um, and what we and that's all in the UK right sorry to butt in there but yeah, all, in the UK. Cool. all in the UK although I am on the board of a, an organization called the World Employment Confederation which is the RECs from all the other countries so we do a okay. lot of stuff together globally as well talking to the UN and other big opinion formers, but we're focused here in the UK, and we're all about making great work happen and okay. the good and the good that recruiters do. You know, we as a as a sector, we open opportun opportunities for people and we help people grow their businesses. That's why I thought I'd put my um, uh, "Love Your Work" T-shirt on today, and this is. <laughs> This is a this is a campaign that was um, uh, founded by our sister federation in Australia, the RCSA, and it is all about recruiter pride, and we should be proud. Mm. We do a great job, and the R the RCSA is really he here to help recruiters. So at, at the basic level, legal advice, training, qualifications. We run the awarding body for recruitment in in the UK that gives out all the recruitment qualifications. But a, a, a really big part of what we do is also representing the industry to people outside recruitment. Okay. And strangely, that's been a bit busier than normal over the last few few weeks. So um, our experience uh, in the last couple of weeks has been of being massively busy. Um, 300, 400% of the demand on our time is normal, uh, partially driven by huge numbers of calls to our helplines. From okay. recruiters trying to work out how to access those government schemes, thinking about you know how do I navigate through what's happened with demand in my market and all the, all those questions that we're probably going to discuss about getting on top of your cash flow, um, okay. but also but also lots and lots of interaction with government. Um, you hinted what what have I been up to? Well, every day I 
I have a daily call with the heads of all the other sector federations from across the economy, the okay. hospitality federation, the retail federation, and so forth, where we talk about what we need to get through to government. We're doing regular calls with ministers to, to make those points, uh, regular calls with senior officials, so really heavily yesterday on getting the details of the furlough scheme sorted out for agencies. Okay. Um, and lots of media work. Before I came on to this, I was talking about the furlough scheme and the, the loan scheme to the FT and just making sure that recruitment is heard, that our voice is at the table. Because we should be proud of, you know, in normal times, we put a million people into work as temps every day and find a million people new jobs as perms every year. And and that that should be our calling card. We we are going to be really important to the recovery from all this. Yeah, and and therefore our campaigns is really about making sure the voice of recruiters is heard. Okay, so my my sort of follow up question to that, and just just very quickly, everyone, before I do, and as you um, talk a bit about this, Neil, I'm just going to um, do do a very quick uh, poll with everyone, um, so we can start getting just some insights into the audience today. Uh, so I'll share those with you, Neil and Tony, um, when they reply. But so just in in a nutshell, then Neil, I know you sort of gave us a really good overview there. Like, what what is the actual sort of direct link and purpose of Rec being involved with the government? And have you met Boris Johnson? Uh, have I met Boris Johnson? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, Actually, when you think about the cabinet and people are in the public eye right now, the best story I can tell is actually not about Boris Johnson, but about Matt Hancock. Okay. Uh, so Matt and I were both sports correspondents on the same local radio station 25 years ago. Wow. Uh, and I was the majority sports co uh, correspondent because I did the football, and he was the minority sports correspondent because he did the cricket. Um, uh, and <laughs> and we, so we were... Um, we were both uh, we, we we both cut our teeth on comms in the same slightly dodged stu uh, but fully licensed student radio station. Um, in terms of links to government, more seriously, um, there's a kind of ongoing uh, formal link um, okay. in, ter in terms of we've got an arrangement with DWP on how we help unemployed people in the in the sector. The they, the government comes to us for advice on regulation. So cast your mind back to. Uh, a couple of decades to January. Um, back in January, we were talking about, well, how, how should you regulate umbrella companies and their use in the sector? And civil servants don't really understand umbrellas, but we do. So okay. they, we, we kind of help the government draft bits of legislation, think about how you do things well. And as part of that, there's a, there's a policy community that, that we can play into and show the value that recruiters are are driving. I sit on the Low Pay Commission that sets the minimum wage and on the board at ACAS. Um, and those right. are places where it's really important recruiters' voices are heard because it's really, really easy in government to assume everyone works like a civil servant. You know, the open ended employment contract, same job for 10 years, paid every month. And, and actually, what, for instance, the furlough scheme has shown us is you have to be thinking about thinking about people who are on contract for services. You have to be people be thinking about people who are paid weekly, people who are paid variably, if you're going to do things well. And it's the REC's job just to make sure government understands that. Okay, that makes sense. Just help you, Tony. Sorry to butt in, but just very quickly yeah. to give you context. Um, we're 50-50 with 50% um, of people do perm recruitment. The other 50% do both, both contracts and perm. Mm -hmm. um, majority of people with us today are uh, business owners um, and the majority of people with us today are actually working. They haven't been furloughed. So sorry mm -hmm. to put in there, Tony, but I just wanted to help you. Yeah, no, no, that no, so ju ju just on that, I think that obviously the, the burning question for, for me as a business owner is, I guess, is, you know, the, the actual um, the furlough scheme that we're talking about. Mm. A lot of the questions we've got are around what furloughing means, obviously not the ability not to work. What does not working actually mean? Could you, is there any clarification from yourself or the government in terms of what not working means and, and what what people are able to do when they're furloughing or, or not furloughing. Well, this is a good opportunity, Tony, for me to say to people, if you want information on everything that's going on, the first place you should go is the REC's COVID hub on our website. Um, and I'm offering you a retro version of that now because you're getting a new version next next month when we finally launch our new website. All paid for before COVID happened, I hasten to add. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the... Um, but on there, we've got absolutely everything that we can give out as much as possible at a time like this, 
open access. There's some things we, we, because of legal insurance, we have to restrict to REC members. But the advice on there is should be people's first point of call. And it's been really getting really good usage. We had 30,000 individual visitors over the last few weeks. They're staying more than five minutes. So it, it's clearly cutting through. But that piece about furlough, if people are furloughed, they should not be working. Um, what does that mean? It means they shouldn't do anything other than things which they are statutorily required to do. So if you furlough a director and, and they have to be involved in filing your accounts, they can help you file your accounts. Um, they can do training while on furlough, but you probably have to pay them for that training at more than just the, the 80%. So furlough is a full bore not working thing. I absolutely have heard from across the industry that a kind of more German short time working arrangement would be better. We haven't got government there yet, but it's a unified, I talked earlier about that group of trade associations from across the economy who are working together. We all think that a furlough scheme where you could furlough someone for three days a week would be quite a good idea. Um, at the moment you can't do that, we're still working on it. What you can do though, is you can unfurlough someone for a week a month if you if you need them to uh, to do something in your business. Wow. Yeah, one of my so, clients has actually been doing that. Yeah. yeah. Go on, yeah. Tony. So, 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 Neil, if you were a business owner right now, a recruitment business owner, what, what would you be doing personally? Um, that's a good question. I, I think it's really, well, first and foremost, get across your cash because it's your cash that, that will tell you. Um, I, I've, I've used, overused Pat Carberry's uh, aphorism too many times on these things, but my dad always said, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, cash is reality. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so first and foremost, and I think most business owners are actually there now, is understanding what your cash glide path is, assuming that this is definitely gonna last three months. It might last six months or even nine months. So think about what your key decision points are. And then take advantage of the government schemes as far as you can. Um, furlough, I, th I, you know, I would encourage people to use furlough for those staff who, for whom it makes make sense for. So if you don't have demand and throughput coming through, and people aren't involved in your kind of marketing and your senior client relationships, furlough probably does make sense. Um, C bills, the loan scheme, I'd encourage everyone to have another look at. So I know a lot of recruitment agencies looked at the government back loan scheme in the first few weeks yeah, after that, the uh, sorry uh, to, after it was launched. Sorry to butt in there, but the, yeah, that was one of the questions submitted by um, Dave Lewis. Mm. It was, is there any specific advice you have on firms trying to access that funding? To be great if you could go into that. So I'll say a little bit now, but there's a podcast that we launched last week on the REC podcast channel on our website, which is just me and Simon Connington from BPS World, who's on the REC Council, who's okay. been through who's been through the process. And um, I'm not claiming to add any a, any sheen to that at all. But Simon offers you absolute gold in that podcast about the work you need to do to to get it right. The most important thing with Seabills is lots of people looked early on and it wasn't really working. The government retooled it completely. It's gone from lending 115 million pounds to in um, in the first three weeks. It's now lending 150 to 250 million pounds a day. Wow. wow. Um, and and what, what are you finding recruitment agencies are typically getting funding for or help with? Um, well, I think it's primarily about bridging that gap on their cash flow, so yeah. that they do, so that they uh, don't build up a cash position that makes recovery of the business very difficult. If you think about it intelligently, it should be aligned to your recovery plan, and that's probably the biggest bit of advice I've got for agency owners, which is, yes, the world will recover. We know the sun will rise. It will come at some point, whether it's June or September or December or early next year. Um, your clients will come back. I'm not sure clients will necessarily come back building the same businesses they had before. Yeah. So that that advice that we we've all heard about getting into your niche and making sure you've got a USP that differentiates yourself, I think that's even more important than normal because mm. I think I, I think this crisis will amplify some changes we were seeing in the sector. That big move towards being more of a professional services sector, where advice and trust with the client and long term relationships are really important to retaining your your position. So if you're if you're in if you're an agency leader right now, get close to your clients. You don't need to be selling them stuff because they might not be there, but 
understand the business that they're trying to build. Build those relationships. I think those are the things that will repay you in spades when it does come back. Okay. Um, good good, good advice. I, I just want to go back onto the furlough piece. I know mm. when you say no work at all, but I think it's, it's a really... It's really vague, isn't it? So, for example, if I'm mm. furloughed at the moment, am I okay to be connecting with people on LinkedIn? Am I okay to be posting content? You know, yeah. is that is that classed as work? For me, recruitment um, work is arranging interviews, getting jobs on, sending candidates out. So is work still classed as me posting content yeah. to say, how are you doing, or, or connecting with someone that might be uh, someone I want to talk to in future? Is, is there anything you can provide information on that? Because that, I think that's, that's been, where the... Yeah, that's, that's been that's a really positive question. Gray, yeah, yeah. That's a grey area yeah. for us, really, yeah, as, as to what, what working looks like and, and what actually work is in recruitment. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, it, part of the challenge with giving a really definitive answer is, of course, that for, um, I, can, I can claim to be one of the small groups of geeks who knew what furlough was b before uh, COVID-19 <laughs> because it's actually quite common in the US labor system. Okay. Um, okay. It's never, it, there's no legal definition of furlough in our system and that's why you get wow. these questions about what work is. I think, I, I think the, the analogy that I would uh, use is paid and unpaid work experience. Yeah, I think we all know that if someone comes in on an internship and is doing stuff that's helping to earn you money, you should probably be paying them. And in fact, the National Minimum Wage Act says you should be paying them. But we also know that if people do things that are around the edges of your business and they're getting experience, then you prob you maybe don't need to pay them for that. Um, and I think that's where we should think about for furlough. So I would say the core productive process that involves billing clients resourcing, interview scheduling, doing the interviews, play, client added value client co conversations about the work that you do with them, all of that off limits for people on furlough. Activity on social media, I think is fine. Um, yeah, I, I, and and, I, and I, I genuinely think some of this is about, um, is about a, a balance of probabilities. I don't think anyone at HMRC is going to be auditing people's LinkedIn feeds for here's an interesting thing about the sector that I've read. Um, they might be they might be more concerned if they get evidence of we've got all these opportunities. Uh, please get in touch with me. Yeah, yeah, interesting, Neil. So, so based on your experience then of, of talking to to Bojo and all, all his mates up there, and it, so you've got three weeks. You work for IDEX Consulting, and we've furloughed you for three weeks. So congratulations, welcome to IDEX, Neil. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's been but, a career ambition for some time, Johnny. But, but unfortunately, we've got to follow you for three weeks. Um, what 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 things are you going to be doing at home? What what would you be doing at home as a furloughed consultant right now? Um, well, first and foremost, we, I think we should all acknowledge that this time is a big resilience challenge for all of us. Whether yeah, you, whether, whether you're furloughed at home doing very little, or whether you're working every hour God sends. Or somewhere somewhere in between, and we're all at home, uh, you know, trying to educate our kids while also both doing. Yeah, you know, I'm trying. I'm in this room doing this. My wife's in another room doing a call, doing a call with some of her students, and the kids are downstairs allegedly doing some schoolwork. Ch <laughs> chances practically zero. Um, so I think there's a lot of just. We're not all going to be that kind of lockdown hero that we see on LinkedIn. Uh, much as I would love to, I am not going to lose the two stone I need to lose during the lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so we have to start with, what can I realistically achieve? And then after that, there is so much creativity going on. And I think you hinted at it, Tony. Uh, people on, lock, uh, uh, on furlough during lockdown, there is so much content being created that is of interest to recruiters and will be helpful as we go back and as we recover. I think dive into that, but dive into, into it in a way that's sustainable for you. I'm very aware, I was reading some research from, um, that came out of China, because of course China's ahead of the, the curve on this, that week five of the lockdown, which is where we are now, okay. is, a, is a particular challenge, yeah. because you, you've lost the kind of newness of it, and you can't quite see the, the end of it yet. Uh, so I think making sure that you're focused on things that will help, but you do that in a really sustainable way because everyone's got five pots to boil on the stove right now. 
Cool. Just, just so- yeah, I guess the big, so, sorry, sorry, he's shut, no, fine, I'll fine. shut up in a minute. I apologise, mate. I know it's your, your uh, podcast yeah, and I'm a co-host. <laughs> Are you right? We continue to talk, yeah? Of course, mate. All right. Thanks, Ish. Um, so, yeah, I guess the biggest concern is that we you, you furlough a number of people. Um, they're sat at home and you, you tell them not, not to do anything. And, and they post a bit of content online. And, and, and a few months down the line, the government come back and say they were actually working. So we, we're taking the money back. I guess that's, that's the worry for ourselves and any business owner, I guess. And also, it's quite nervy for furloughed individuals who are sat there that they don't want to compromise the business as well. So we've got furloughed people that I know want to work and they know that, that they're furloughed you know they want to work but they're, they're also scared to do anything in terms of content because they don't want to compromise ourselves and the business yeah so I, I guess that's have you got anything that you could sort of assure us on that at all or any anything that can make me feel a little bit more comfortable or the pilot people feel a bit more comfortable just, about what they're just, doing just to add to that you no know, which is what all i was going to say tony was yeah people were messaging about this in the in in the uh, chat panel here daryl hughes has said um yes it's class as work it's marketing Melissa Tang is saying our colleagues have been told no activity on LinkedIn, Instagram, not allowed to like any other colleagues' posts. So, so there, this really is a, a big gray area. So, mm. Tony, I'm glad you're pushing on it because it's the business that I'm in and a lot of people are unsure of this because of the reasons that Tony just said. Yeah, and also you've, you've got a lot of people from what I see, you know, we've, we've one of our competitors have furloughed, you know, 60, 70 people for two months. So you're talking about a huge amount of cash that they're taking from the government. Mm-hmm. If in three, month, three or four months' time the government come back and go, actually you were posting online so we're going to take that money back it's yeah. you know we're back in a situation where the the, the 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 business is going to have to fold in a few months time because they're taking that cash i suppose yeah. so so it's a gray area but it's something that we, we must i guess we just don't want to be bit, bit in the in the bun do we yeah exactly. um, so I don't, I don't know what i guess that's why i'm asking for yourself Nick. Is, is there anything yeah. is, is there an op, is there a chance that we could get bitten in future take the furloughed money um and, and we get penalised for someone posting and marketing you know there's even variants on the Q&A here from people having mm. completely different opinions and business owners so there's definitely not enough clarity on that what what uh, how can you help me with my dilemma uh, so, so first of all it's a good question and I, I don't think any of us have ever thought about in this kind of detail about the difference between the individual and the corporate on LinkedIn and that's mm. really where where the, the line is isn't it um, so my first bit of reassurance HMRC's audit is not going to be particularly focused um, on um, what pe- what furloughed staff are putting on LinkedIn. They're going to be they're going to be fo- focused on people creating fake employees and cre- and trying to claim uh, claim furlough cash. Uh, um, I've, I've thought of that I, one now. That's that's why the whole RTI event thing <laughs> is so clear in the rules because they're uh, and. Uh, government's intention is unlike lots usually when they want to control where money goes very very tightly is to get support to employees who are not being paid by other ways so you, that that so that that's just a bit of framing to come to LinkedIn post yeah I can understand why some agencies want to take a, a caution first approach yeah. um, and and yeah you know, ultimately that's a, a decision that individual businesses will make what I have said to friends who are furloughed um, is there is a distinction on LinkedIn between marketing activity for your business and what you as a professional in the field are doing. Okay, I, I share an awful lot of REC content <clears throat> on LinkedIn every day. If I were furloughed, I probably shouldn't be sharing everything the REC puts out. But... I probably could comment on some of it and as long as I'm sharing other content as well as my employers content and that none of the content that my, my that I'm sharing from my employers is overtly commercial <clears throat> um, then I think it's fine so it is that that it's that piece around are you acting because you are a professional in the field and you're commenting on things like I might see something from the low pay commission or from the TUC or the CBI as a as a lead policy leader and and say that's really interesting i'll share that and put a little comment on i think that's all right um if if you're blasting out stuff from your employer absolutely not i think would be the line okay so just a quick one so question just as we're talking about um this so question from uh andrew uh, uh, gibson 
Can you ask Neil what his advice is around recruitment agencies now applicable for the business rates relief and how we go about accessing this? Well, thanks, Andrew. I, I, that was something we pushed really hard for. It only applies to some agencies, so do read the guidance. Um, it applies to those agencies who are open to members of the public uh, for interviews and so forth and, and the business site. It applies per site as well. So if you have a rate, if you have a branch network, it applies for each individual branch. Uh, the first piece of advice is talk to your local authority. So we found out about this, um, one, we got the confirmation of this uh, Monday two weeks ago. I know that some of the REC members that got in touch with the local authority that day have now been paid. Okay. So, so pick up the phone to your local authority. They all have teams that are working on this and work it through with them. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Neil, uh, first of all, before we go, I know I've fired a lot of questions at you there. I think it's really great that you've actually um, got the balls, basically, to come on and, and answer questions. So so fair play to you, because I do think it's really commendable, and I think it's it's great that, they're, that you're doing it, first of all. Uh, but that's my pre um, <laughs> before I fire some nasty questions at you now, right? I, I saw that coming a mile off. <laughs> and I, I, the, the one, the one thing I'll say is what I said to you and Hisham before, which is if I don't know the answer, um, course, yeah. I, I, rega I regard it as a strength in leaders to say I don't know, and I'm going to say it. <laughs> no, I respect that, mate. I respect that. But I think I've got a question from a guy called Matt Green, yeah. um, and he was saying, "What have the rec managed to achieve to help recruiters through their political lobbying during COVID nineteen? So I guess. Uh, yeah, what, what's been your achievement, I guess? What have you, what have you done for us lowly recruiters while, uh, out there while talking to Bojo? Literally just talked about uh, uh, adding recruitment agencies to the list of um, uh, 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 business rates support uh, yeah. sites. Uh, that's really important. We worked really, really hard in that first week to get CJRS set up. Uh, so if you remember Rishi Sunak standing on that platform thanking the business organisations, we were the recruitment business organisation that he meant, and we had a huge amount of work in that in that week. Uh, Seabills, we were we were less involved in because it was really the financial sector that took the lead with the chancellor and work uh, on working through that. But what we are finding is, you know, I t I was talking to Nadim Zahawi, the base minister, last week about some of the changes that need to be made to make sure that recruiters in particular qualify, and yeah. Uh, if you're not a kind of finance geek, sorry for what I'm about to say, but the debt profile of recruitment businesses is different to most businesses because, of course, what we do is we have a, a lot of short-term debt, which is people we've placed in, on the temp side, people we've placed and, and, um, and have paid, but the client hasn't yet paid us. And, and so last week I was talking to the British Business Bank about how we... Uh, how we make sure the banks understand that recruiters should look different in debt profile, and they've taken that away to the to the provider, uh, the the provider Sucibo. So it's that kind of stuff that yeah. that we're really knee deep in at the moment. Nice, quick quick question, uh, great question from Chris Shear that just come through, and I've seen a lot of people post about this. I think. I mean, I, um, I'm, I'm down in Eastbourne at the moment where I grew up, but I um, live in London. And if you were to go in a shared office space like we work or like the one Chris has put in, um, like Runway East, mm. you are going to bump into a recruiter. There is yeah. a recruitment business in every single one of these offices. <laughs> so Chris's, uh, Chris's question is, our office is a shared space called Runway East in Bristol, which is like a WeWork type service office. And I found that this makes claiming the government grant hard because I don't directly pay business yeah. rates myself so mm -hmm. any advice or knowledge of what um work has been done for example what has worked because a lot of people will be in that situation for sure so rent in general is an open topic for us um clearly there have been some changes made um in terms of the rules about um uh, around uh, commercial leases i think the but you know chris is absolutely right the um the, the point is sharpest for those who are, have um, spaces, who have taken spaces in places like WeWorks and Regis's. Yeah. Um, and that is primarily, unfortunately, a commercial arrangement that you know government is not particularly keen to get involved in. They say we're, we're delivering the business rates rebate, um, but of course you, you aren't the people who pay the business rates, so we can't <laughs> rebate the business rates. Yeah, it's um, tough. Uh, uh, it's really difficult for us as an industry organisation. Well, I did, did a post on the REC blog a couple of weeks ago, and I've written to a whole slew of organisations, jobs boards, um, uh, um, serviced office companies, to say, 
Can you do critically? Anything? Yeah, you guys benefit from this industry and yeah. have benefited from this industry over a decade of really spectacular growth. And it's on, you know, we either all come out of this together or we come out of it separately. And I think particularly for the serviced office providers, let's be clear, the one sector I wouldn't want to be in coming out of this is uh, commercial property. Because, <laughs> you know, case in point, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a chief executive of a business, right? We've got 70 staff. All right, REC HQ is 10,000 square feet, right? It's too big for us as it stands. We're, our lease is up in 2022. I'm coming to 8,000 square feet. Uh, if you ask me in February today, I'm coming to five thousand square feet. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I have seen, have impact, yeah. I have seen my business operate remotely in a way that, yeah. to be honest, I didn't think was possible. So, it's actually it comes back to trust and long-term relationships. It is it absolutely in landlords and service office companies' interest to reach an accommodation with, um, yeah. uh, w w with tenants. Now, what I would say is. Everyone, jobs boards, tenants, LinkedIn, are really, really cautious about putting a general offer out there because everyone will take it whether they need it or not. Yeah. Go specific. Talk to your relationship manager, to your client, uh, the person who deals with you, and say, look, I really need you to help me out. By the way, the REC says you should help me out. You can use my blog post. Feel feel free to pay me an aid. I'm happy to uh, to to be the bogeyman for all these things, um, and just see what they'll do. Because I am starting to see people doing interesting things. I had a story from a member last week about a landlord who had come in and put up a temporary divide in their office so that they were using the space they needed and adjusted the rent accordingly. Nice. And that, that was in a serviced office space. So yeah. get get the pressure onto your account manager. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I mean, I, I just have a co-worker membership in the, with the office group and I reached out to my the, the content I have there and they've froze my membership for four months. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, de def, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? But I yeah. think, yeah, well, well answered. Tony, did yeah. you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's interesting you're saying that the industry you wouldn't want to be in is commercial property. And mm. I know that, uh, you do a lot of trends analysis uh, at the rec. So if you were, and I know there's a guy, James Howell Newton, that's asked for advice for an agency startup during this crisis. Yeah. I guess with, with the analysis that you've looked at, what areas do you think are going to be the sort of the growth areas in recruitment over the next 12 to 18 months or, or even longer? So um, I was on a call with an old mate of mine uh, who's now HRD at, uh, at a charity, but uh, previously was at Asda and... Uh, one of the big rail companies and, and the BBC and so forth. Um, and his take was that he, and I agree with this, I spent 15 years at the CBR before I came to the REC and um, working with FTSE 250 HRDs. He and I both haven't met an HRD who isn't coming back to this to accelerate something that they knew they were going to have to do anyway. So recruitment will be there, but your clients will be growing in different places. Um, what do I think that means? Uh, I think it's really telling that across all the sectors that aren't really COVID fight relevant, logistics, um, healthcare and so forth, where yeah. demand is still strong because of what we're doing. You know, Tesco have hired 45,000 people uh, in the last month. Um, IT and technology and science-led stuff is is actually not down very much. Right. Yeah. So it's down. Don't believe the idea that it's resistant to the fall. But I think IT and particularly uh, things which are about people's digital di digital user experience and digital journeys, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think are going to be super important. Not least because, and I don't know what your experience, Tony, at your place was, we saw the lockdown start before the lockdown started. Most businesses were already shutting their physical space down before Boris banned us. At the other end, we know from China that if that when the lockdown ends, you know, if Boris stands up and uh, ends the lockdown on a Thursday night, believe me, we're not all going for a curry on the Friday night. No. Yeah. No. So, <laughs> so, so, so that piece around how how has our economy changed? Lots more digital. Lots more things. So, marketing, for instance. I think you'll see the a further enhancement of that long-term shift towards digital. Um, if you look into industries, I think it'd be in, the, the trend that I think will be most interesting 
is how far the idea of just-in-time production will be damaged and whether we're going to see more belief in mm. building up domestic supply chains. So I think, for instance, manufacturing might have a gentle recovery okay. uh, over the next decade. Um, I mean, I think the original question had FS and insurance. Britain will remain an FS insure, an insurance leader and it will bounce back. What do, can I just um, uh, build on to this? So a great question, and I've been speaking to a lot of my clients about this because I think I think it's fair to say that when we start bouncing back out of this, however that looks like, that you might have less competition. Mm -hmm. So I guess what, what's been, so, so the question from Suki Sidhu was, by how much will this uh, situation shrink the number of recruitment firms? Mm -hmm. What have you been seeing right now? Um, and yeah, could the survivors who best adapted benefit from a less saturated market when it's all over? What do you think about that? So I said earlier that I think um, moments like this are an amplifier of changes that are happening. I think the best businesses will rely on the long-term relationships and the trust they have with clients and the good financial planning that they've got to survive. I think some businesses may be struggling a little bit, might you know might not come back, especially in that very small space where they're very small but not quite niche enough. Okay. So I do I do think that. Um, I think we all know that the industry will shrink a bit this year. Have you but, seen that in your members? Um, we we haven't seen a lot yet. Okay. Um, what what we have seen in a really big way is it, it, it is kind of the the beginnings of a big debate about consolidation. I think there'll be a lot of um, merger and realignment activity as we begin to see the path out. I'm aware that there is finance out there for some. For, for some firms and uh, investors who are looking to be acquisitive okay. um, and and there's a kind of a, a logic behind that in financial advisors saying this is a time if you're going to invest in a recruitment business this is probably the time to be thinking about it because clearly you've got a certain generation of owners who are maybe thinking of exit at this point mm. but also you've got um, We've got thirty thousand recruitment businesses in the in the UK, but actually only about four and a half five thousand of real scale. I suspect we'll we'll end up with more of scale and maybe a smaller number in that thirty thousand in the year's time. Nice. So okay. Neil, I, I read today that the recruitment sector last year was worth thirty eight point nine billion pounds. Is that right? Yep. What what what's the forecasted figures for for post COVID <laughs> um, numbers? About twelve twelve pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I did. I did see a joke from one of my council meet, meetings uh, today. Uh, that the, the big measure investors will be looking for now is EBITDA, which is EBITDA, <laughs> but after coronavirus effects as well. Uh, but the I, I think um, I said earlier. I'd say I don't know if I don't know, and to be honest, that's unpredictable. What I would say is two things. One, uh, the industry shrank uh, by to about eighteen billion in 2009 from about 25, 26, 27. Um, I, I think that kind of level of demand is probably uh, not, you know, not out of step here. But the big difference with this is this recession hasn't happened in a normal way, right? If you go back to your Keynes, um, you know, the economy is driven by animal spirits. P if people feel a bit worried, they stop spending, uh, they businesses stop investing, they stop hiring, and and you get this kind of gradual downturn that happens over months. And actually, by the time you realise you're in a recession, it's over, and the recovery started to happen. And that's a kind of demand-driven recession. What we've got here is a supply-driven recession. Governments decide to turn the economy off to save people's lives. The shorter the gap is before we turn the economy back on, the less damaging this thing will be. The longer it is, we have to accept the more damage it will be because there'll be more unemployed people and businesses will be in a weaker position to invest after the recession. That's why all of the business organizations are not campaigning to end the lockdown now, not like these mm -hmm. uh, not jobs on the Michigan State House lawn, um, but, but we're saying when we get to the point where we feel it's possible, we need a really good plan. We had a really good plan for a staged opening of the of the economy, um, and a plan for what happens if there is a second wave. 
Because really, what we'd like to do is get to a plan that, that means we don't all have to spend 12 weeks inside if there is a second wave in October or November. Please, no. Yeah. And, and, and so that, that, that's, a, <laughs> that, that's a developing part of our discussion with government now. Yeah. So okay. that's good. I mean, there's a lot of talk about staged, staged return to work and obviously priority roles would go back sooner. Where does recruitment rank in terms of priorities, do you think, to the government mm. if, if we're... In terms of a staged return, would we would we first, middle, or last? Um, did, you, did you see that po- picture? How important are from, we? Uh, did you see that picture shared? A few got shared around from the Daily Mail. Obviously, it wasn't true. But is, the, that, is, the that, the, is that what you read? Is you read the Daily no, Mail? I don't, I don't read the paper, mate. Come on, man. but like the 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 red, green, and orange, the like traffic light system. Yeah, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, I thought yeah, that yeah. was but the most sensible thing that I've seen from government so far. Really? Yeah, but I mean, where, where where would recruitment rank really in terms of you know the phased return? I guess I think the the priority roles will go back first, but you know I guess have you got? I guess what I'm getting at, when do you think we'll be back in the offices, Neil? I'm, I'm asking you a question you, that isn't related to the wreck; it's just your personal opinion. So um, I'll give you I'll give you an estimate at the end, at end of this, and it is an estimate and a guess, nothing more. Um, where does recruitment sit? I think actually we go subsector by subsector. There, you remember that we have actually got some recruiters who are deemed as key workers um people working on site um uh, with 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 food supply companies doing blue collar supply into food manufacturing Uh, and we've been supplying letters out of the rec that people can carry on their way to work to to show to show that they're key workers um so i think um and i think we'll see a bit of that I think when recruitment goes back, probably depends when your sec- the sector that you're the sectors you're serving go go back. Right, that makes sense. Uh, um, I think we're in the middle, basically. Um, we all know that probably there isn't much of a, a loosening of the economy until the schools reopen, and I think the schools will probably be one of the first bits, because um, that enables people to go to work in a really substantial way. Um, I think. N- the next stage will be offices that can open that aren't attracting, aren't open to large numbers of the public. And your classic recruitment site can open in that space. Uh, you might still be doing your interviews digitally, but you could you could find a way to, to bring people back. What I'd encourage every, in fact, I had this call for the REC this morning, every recruitment business owner to be doing is thinking about if I could open, but the government said to me I had to take sensible social distancing steps, <clears throat> How would I open? So, case, case in point, we are dividing the REC staff in two. Uh, we have enough space in the office for half of the staff to be in and be socially distant enough from each other. And with the first stage of us reopening Dorset House, the REC HQ, we'll be having half of the staff in on any one day and the rest working from home. And so, so, what's my planning for how we do that? And then when it happens, obviously, Big gatherings, you know. In the drawer behind me here, I've got uh, I've got two tickets to Wales versus Scotland in the 2020 Six Nations, uh, which was of course famously called off at the last possible minute last month. I don't imagine I'm going to that game anytime soon. I don't imagine pubs are opening soon. I think recruiters can expect to open before that. At a guess, I think I see I see I see me late. Uh, very late May and into June is the point where we start to see things open up. Late May. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Um, Mitch, I know you want to fire into some questions, don't you? From uh, that have been sent across. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all all yeah. I was going to say, I guess, as we're sort of talking a bit more about what things are going to look like when we come out of this and these types of things, I guess, Neil, what, what's your thoughts? It was a question from Rosie and Murray, which was basically, how do you think the recruitment industry is going to change mm. um, after going through this? I think I've. I've spoken to loads of business owners who, if you were to speak to them a couple of months ago around what's your thoughts on flexible working, they would have gone, F off, I want my people in the office. But their hand's been forced. They're, they're now doing that. So I think, yeah, I think what 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 are your thoughts on the on our industry, the recruitment industry, and how it's going to look and be different as we come out of this? Well, you know, we had a model that was working. And for, for 10 years, it worked really well for lots of people across the industry. And of course, when you've got a model that's working, what you tend to do is you tend to stay in that, what government would call that silver command space of getting the tactics right, getting the marketing right, and, and push from there. And you don't spend as much time in the kind of gold command space of what's the strategy and the direction. Yeah. Um, I think this forces you into that space. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
case in point, the, uh, the you know the I need to be able to eye eyeball my people and look at their poll rates. Well, <laughs> yeah, you do you do need ways of measuring your staff's productivity, but they're probably different. And you, even before this, we were getting a uh, a different feel from uh, recruitment agency leaders about what the expectations on staff were and how they were changing. It wasn't the industry that I joined in the 90s where, you know, if I didn't bash the phone enough times every day, uh, I was in real trouble. Um, always said my number, so it was fine. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the, the, the challenge is... Um, the challenge is that we're finding new ways to be productive. And I think the thing, as I hinted earlier, the thing that cuts through for me is how are we becoming a professional services industry? How are we yeah. becoming more advisory? How are we spending more of our time on the added value conversations with candidates and thinking about candidate experience and yeah. clients and thinking about client planning? Uh, so the sensible business owner is thinking, Get close to clients and understand how their business is changing. Find my niche that I can deliver a USP. Build a team that can deliver that without me being the critical point of sale in everything at all times. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you're small, that's it. And then on, on the candidate side, just think about why candidate experience will continue to matter ever more. And so think about that throughput. And all of the process stuff that we ask staff to do, Digitize, digitize, digitize. I think that that package is probably where people are going. And all of that, actually, you could have said in January, but yeah. the driver wasn't there in the same way because we're because the, yeah, the right. old model was we're, we're still delivering. Uh, the thing I'd um, the example I'd point to is retail in Britain between two thousand and five and twenty fifteen. So if you remember, yeah, those of, I know you're not old enough to rem uh, remember the session, but there was a time when Marks and Spencers ruled the high street. Really? Uh, yeah. I, 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 think, I think Woolworths had something to say about that. To <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm still mourning the loss of the Woolworths picking right. up. Mate, I remember um, Woolworths. Yeah. Come on. Woolies, mate. Woolies. Bang in. Yeah. Woolies. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so anyway, what happened in retail was there used to be a curve that looked, uh, that was kind of, an upward pointing arrow uh, and you had right. a few kind of pound stretchery shops on the low end that people were a bit snooty about and you had one or two really expensive shops at the other end and and everyone else bought bought their pants from Marks and Spencers what happened in retail was we had a massive growth in um, in a really transactional business at one end and we had a massive growth in high luxury at the other end which became a bit more affordable and it was the middle of the market that disappeared. I think we'll, we'll see that in recruitment. So mm. at one end, you'll have people who are doing staffing, who are doing uh, much more deep structured supply arrangements with their clients, where they're involved in helping the client design that, where the margin comes from the level of throughput, or rather the, the, where the profit comes from the level of throughput on the margin, and where the bit, there'll be a big pressure on compliance and treating candidates well, because that's not going to go away. Government is not going to get smaller after this, I suspect, for a while. Um, and you know we're all going to be paying for the government support in tax for years to come. And then at the other end, I think your deep specialists, high margin, lower throughput, are going to be are, are going to, to to benefit. So if I were advising. Um, a recruitment agency owner. You pick what, which one of those you're going to be. I think yeah. the kind of the, the the day of the generalist recruiter was already ending. We know that we've talked about it for years. Yeah. But this will this will just be the na the nail uh, yeah. in the coffin. I've definitely got another question, but uh, Tony, do you want to add anything to that or anything that? No, no. I mean, the, the question is actually a little bit uh, left field, I guess. Obviously, for, for you, it's good to understand, you know, the views and and how the the industry works. Did you listen? Do you listen to the Recruitment Roller Coaster podcast? I have. I have been known to. Hey. I, have to say, I, I, I mean, in the interest of fairness, I uh, I also do enjoy brain food on the other weekend. Okay. Okay. Nice. And what was your favourite episode, and what do you think of Hisham as a as a host? So <laughs> Hisham as a host is good. I didn't realise he'd snuck in on me at a, at a presentation at the. Uh, at the, at the expo, unfortunately, I I had to shoot off to a meeting with members, so I didn't get to see Hisham, which is one of my great loss, great losses. Favorite episode? Well, I mean, 
how could I possibly pick? This one's pretty good. I like that guy <laughs> from the REC. <laughs> um, what, 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 what all, all I wanted to ask, um, it was a question from Amy um, Owens. Hopefully I'll pronounce that right. But I think we're talking about sort of what I'd be focusing on, the positive sort of as we come out of this for the industry and, and how it's going to look and be shaped. But I think it's a great question. She said, what do you see as being the top three challenges for the recruitment industry in Q3 and Q4? Of this year, so you've spoken oh, about good. yeah. We've spoken about what what you should be doing and what you should be thinking about. Well, what have been the the top? Cha- what do you think will be the top challenges in the next two quarters for recruitment businesses? Uh, one, understanding the new normal. Uh, so, okay. um, I think we there was a lot of talk when this first started happening last month of a kind of V shaped bounce. You turn supply off, you turn it back on, everything's back to normal. I I, I think it's a it's a softer return curve. So, yeah, a big challenge is on right-sizing what you're doing in your business to the market as it is and not, and not resting on hope that everything will just return back to normal. Um, so keeping that even as things are improving, that discipline that we've learned over the last month is going to be really important. I think the second one is uh, you're going to have to be a bit like Sherlock Holmes with the magnifying glass finding the demand. Uh, so getting close to the clients and understanding where there is potential for growth and maybe looking at where there are other things that you can do. Back in um, the financial crisis of 2008-9, we had a lot of members who got into things like um, uh, candidate advice and uh, and coaching and things like that. So there might be some some additional services that you might be willing to offer, outplacements and other, um, that you might be able to offer in your niche that would be helpful and then I think the third thing is your own people and uh, not just because um, uh, the furlough scheme is time limited by definition if the furlough scheme comes to an end and you can't take all your people back on you are heading for laying people off um, you so you there's that but there's also the whole survivor syndrome thing which is with the team once you've done that right sizing with the team that you then have how do you get them focused on on the right things for the future of the business? And I do think there's a real risk that the kind of batten down the hatches, get over the cash, hold on to everything tightly. We're not doing the marketing. We're not, that that persists into the upturn and actually holds businesses back. So okay. it, it's about having some confidence about backing the marketing and the outreach and the challenge uh, the, the the growth potential that you see in your in your market and you can only do that by getting close to the clients nice okay um i think as, as we sort of come to the end of this i guess it'd be great just to sort of wrap up really on sort of if everyone listening right now and joining us were rec members what what and what would you be saying to these people and how would you be communicating to them what what should they be doing what should they be thinking about and sort of parting words really for hopefully future rec members mm-hmm. <laughs> well of course they all should be rec members and we'll be happy to bring them on board in due, in due course we've had six new members this week which in this environment you think awesome. uh, is not it seems, it seems unlikely look the rec is helping here to help your business grow um even even when that's not what your business is doing. We're here to help your business. Um, our advice, well, one, all recessions end. All economic yeah. activity returns. Uh, while it might not be the time for super optimism, uh, it is a time for pragmatism. Right now, you, you've probably got to cross your cash flow. Uh, assume that your worst case is your core. Build on that. Make some decisions about how you grow now and do that based on spending the time you have to get close to your clients. We will do everything we can to help you with government. We'll do everything we can to help you, uh, to help you in other ways too. The the most kind of, the the strangest thing we've done this week is we've written a brief to dealing with local journalists for agencies because suddenly local journalists started talking to agencies around the country. Well, one, that's a great way actually to get your name out there and you should definitely do it. But clearly there can be some difficult, not as difficult as Tony's questions, but some difficult yeah. questions that come from uh, that come from journals. So if you look on the COVID, uh, REC COVID Hub, there's a little link that you can email our head of comms to uh, to get the REC guide to talking. Talk why do, to why do you think? Why do you think they're? Why do you think they're doing that? Or interested in that? 
we're getting through the initial shock and people are interested in you know the jobs market and how uh, and how it reacts but they're also wanting to ask questions about temps and furlough we haven't talked a lot about the holiday pay issue for furloughing temps um, that's something that we're working really hard on at, at the moment and we're starting to see members get questions about you know would you would you furlough temps under what circumstances so that kind of work just making sure people are well supported to to do their businesses do their business right when they when, uh, when they're talking to journals or things like that okay. the RAC, the RAC ultimately is a members organization it's like a building society my bo my boss is the chair but the chair is elected by the members um, and uh, uh, there, there's no the only profit we make is stuff that gets reinvested in the REC for the good of the industry. So at the end of the day, it's your organisation, and we do the things which help you best. So uh, get involved and tell uh, and tell us what those things are. Because while it's a bus and not a taxi, you know we don't do we have three thousand three hundred members. We don't do what every single member tells us all of the time. We are pretty good at working out where the bus routes should be. Okay. Yeah. Just one, um, one last one last question, really, Neil. Is it? Do, do you ever see the industry becoming regulated? <laughs> well, my my, my uh, answer, of course, is the industry is regulated. So, yeah. Well, okay. Okay. Do you okay. mean license? You mean license? Lo licensed. Yeah. yeah. Ig ignore the regulated and, and replace that with licensed. Is what I meant. Yeah. I think um, we need. Is there going to be a point where you need to have qualifications to be a recruitment consultant to to advise clients or candidates? Is my question. Um, I don't think that kind of regulated profession piece, you know, like a lawyer or a doctor would come in. I do think that I, I think I do think that a more robust form of quality control is likely whether that's a strengthened EAS as part of this new single enforcement body or a really interesting topic which is that Matthew Taylor who wrote the the, the workplace reform report for Theresa May and is now director of labor market enforcement and therefore technically the employment agency standards inspectors boss um, put out a couple of months ago which is how can we take some of these industry codes that we have? You know, you have to pass a compliance test to be an REC member, um, and and how can we make sure they're really robust? And I think we'll come under quite a lot of pressure from government on that, uh, and not just us, other actors in the industry, APSCO and others, um, to have a think about how we can further invest in uh, standards in the industry after all of this. Uh, with the threat being that we'll license you if not, but I actually think that something robust run by the industry is probably better for for clients and candidates because because it's just going to be more relevant than something designed mm -hmm. in Whitehall. Yeah, no, good. Um, just just a quick one, Tony. I'd love to get your sort of parting words really because I think you're in the trenches right now. You own a recruitment business, so I think it'd be good to just just get your thoughts on what your message is to your people. But just just a quick one, Neil. Uh, just mm -hmm. before we. Um, Finish. So, um, Marion uh, submitted a question, which was just really simple, which was, are are the REC running any surveys at the moment, or will be running any surveys on sort of how this is affecting or impacting agencies that could be useful for people to keep an eye out on? Uh, we've got some flash surveys on what the market is doing. Uh, that there's one coming out Friday morning on where the temp and the the perm markets currently are obviously that has an impact on agencies. We are doing some surveys pretty regularly, both through uh, at, at the moment, so there will be stuff coming out over the next few uh, over the next few weeks. Okay, cool. And Tony, part in words, mate. What what's the message that you're saying to you and your people? Um, I think to look to look through it. I think it's yeah. really easy. Um, you know, to look at now and what's happening, and we get so many knockbacks at the moment, aren't we? Whether it's cancelling interviews or pulling jobs, I think it's to look through it and and build your personal brand and your business based on how it will look post COVID. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of positives that come out of it for the industry. You know, the fact that we're pulling together with you coming on this and all that sort of stuff now. You know, people pulling together for ideas and sharing experiences and and actually a slicker recruitment process. Yeah. Uh, with companies appreciating the value of recruiters and, and the value of the process as well. So I think the only message I'd say is look through it um, mm. and look at what, what it looks like post-COVID. And, and yeah, it's tough at the moment. There's a lot of knockbacks, but we'll all be better for it longer term. Awesome. 
Well, look, just want to say thanks, Neil, for joining us. Really appreciate your time being honest thanks, uh, with the audience. Tony, really enjoyed this with you, mate. So thank, thank thanks for your time mate. and your input. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to end this now, but really appreciate all of your time. Um, and, yeah, just a huge thanks. Keep going, and we'll get through this.